Hi, I'm Charles Kachman, Editorial Director of Abrams Comic Arts, and I'm here in the offices of King Features in the Hearst Building in New York City. You know, it's an amazing skyline behind us, and I'm sitting here with Patrick McDonald, the creator and artist and writer behind Mutz. Hey, Charlie. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting here with Patrick, and I just want to um, congratulate you on 25 years. That's an amazing milestone. You know, it's, it, 25 years, it is an amazing milestone, if I say so myself. Uh, sometimes I feel like I've been doing it for a million years, and sometimes I feel like I just started. And it's exciting. It's still exciting every day to look at that blank page and see what Earl and Mooch are going to do. Yeah, see, I mean, to come up, you have to come up with an idea every day. You do, you know, uh, seven strips a week. But you don't do, you don't uh, write a strip a day. What's your process for, for like, coming up with? You know, it, it's changed over the years. But uh, the process I do right now is I try to do three to four weeks in one batch hmm. and that could be about a week and a half two weeks of, of work so this is just conceptualizing right like no, that's everything that's everything that's everything I start with like I, there's a little park by my house and I usually sit on a bench in this park with a, hmm. uh, a notebook and I don't leave until I have at least three weeks worth of jokes wow. and um, depending how long the day is um, and then then I start the process you know, with doing the pencils and the inks and the lettering and the coloring. And do you work in order or do you, will you sometimes do later strips that you know that will come later just you know, because you have more of a sense for them? You know, I, I do it, um, it it's in, it's in, everything is in order. I, I, do, I write the jokes first and then it's penciling and then it's inking and then um, lettering and then coloring. So hmm. it's, it, it's done like a an assembly line, right. <laughs> but it's just me. Yeah, and you've talked a little bit, I'd uh, love to get a little bit more of your process. I mean, for you, you know, I know you're a big fan of Char Charles M. Schultz and uh, Peanuts, and you talk about cartooning, just sort of reducing things down to the essential. Would would your idea of a perfect strip be a strip with no words, or you know, few words, <laughs> or as few as possible? Like, what's a your perfect idea? strip is one that makes me laugh, ah. <laughs> and hopefully <laughs> makes other people laugh. Um, you know, Charles Schultz is funny. Uh, one of the nicest things about doing much as I got to meet and become friends with my hero, Charles Schultz. And he was always proudest of the strips he did that didn't have words, that, you know, mm. that it's, it's a visual medium and if you can tell the joke with no words. And, and I'm, I'm from the less is more school. I really believe in pairing, pairing. I mean, you know, with a comic strip, you only have one panel, two panel, three panels, four panels usually tops for a daily. Right. And, uh, you know, so if the, as, the more you can say with as little as possible really works for the medium. So I'm always into pairing, pairing things down. I feel like we're, we're, we're close to poetry. We try to get, say, just the right thing and draw just the right thing to uh, get to the essence of what we're trying to do. And you've seen it evolve over the years. I see it as a reader working with you on this book. Uh, we, we have a 25th anniversary book, by the way. But as we were working on this book, um, I saw the you know, sort of evolution. Um, what are the kind of things that, you know, in the beginning that you were doing that you sort of realized, like, were, if not, weren't necessary, but sort of just evolved? Well, you know, uh, when you first, you know, it's funny, I wanted to be a comic strip artist, mainly because I was in love with Peanuts ever since I was a little kid, maybe four or five years old. Uh, but I never, for all those years I believed in that, and that was my whole life, I never really thought about the reality of 365 days a yeah. year. Like, that didn't sink in until I actually <laughs> signed the contract and started MUTS. So um, you really learn on the job. I mean, there's no way not right. to, to practice for this. And um, so you really learn on the job. So early on, I think I, um, I think I fine-tuned it. I think all artists fine-tune it. And it's just something you do. I mean, if you look at any comic strip, you know, the way the characters look the first year, constantly evolves and it's right. not that the artist makes a conscious decision oh, I'm gonna make my dog look different it's just as, as you learn it it just evolves the way you evolve mm -hmm. so um, yeah, I think this you know I look at the early strips and what's kind of exciting about them I, I, I'm like it I really like them but I don't feel like I'm the person who did them. Oh that's right. Yeah. So you can view it objectively. Yeah I can view them now after 25 years I can look at those and uh, just enjoy them for what they are and it's like wow Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And when you were first starting out, so you, you um, I'd like to sort of talk a little bit about, you know, how you, how you came to King Features and, and how you, you were doing strips before, but, you know, just sort of here and there. Um, talk a little bit about that and then how you came to King. Yeah, sure. Well, like I said, I wanted to be a cartoonist ever since I was a little kid. Um, 
and I went to school right here in Manhattan to School of Visual Arts and took illustration and cartooning. I had Will Eisner as a teacher, uh -huh. the, the, uh, the man who created the spirit. Um, and I also took painting. I was just interested in making art. Um, but, so when I graduated, I had an illustration portfolio. And during, during classes in my senior year, I figured I have a portfolio. I might as well go out there and try to get work. And uh, boy, uh, the art director of the Village Voice, George Del Marico, was nice enough to give this really young, snotty kid <laughs> A, a job and he gave me an illustration job and I, I lived in New York at the time and I woke up early Wednesday morning to get the Village Voice and he put my illustration on the cover of the Village Voice and he put my illustration on almost every page of the magazine. It, it was a special issue about critics mm -hmm. and I drew this little critic. Right. So he literally put the critic throughout the... So my first job, it was just very inspiring. Oh, that, that's yeah, it was re really nice of him. And the, um, now, The Voice is this free paper that's all over the city, so yeah, is yeah, that exciting yeah. to just constantly come across it as you're walking through yeah, the city? Yeah, no, yeah, no. I, I was there. I was, my little character was all over New York. It was really exciting. Um, so then I, I, you know, I put my comic strip dreams on hold because I started getting magazine work. Um, so I, I did magazine work for almost 10 years, and my huh. poor wife had to hear me say almost every year that I really need to try a comic strip. And eventually, after about 10 years of illustrating, I said, yeah, it's, it's time to at least try to do a comic strip. What happened was um, I met uh, Arnie Roth, the great illustrator, at a Sports Illustrated party. And he told me that I could join the, the uh, National Cartoon Society. And I thought you only could join the National Cartoon Society if you had a comic strip. But he said, no, if you do humorous illustrations, that he was a member, and I could join as, a, you know, an, as an illustrator. So I joined the NCS and uh, got to go to one of their uh, Rubin Award dinners. And I got to meet Charles Schultz and I was surrounded by <laughs> working cartoonists. And that, that's when it, it hit me that, oh, I should, I've been wanting to do this my whole life. It's right. time to try. So, um, you know, much as a combination of my love for comics, but it's also my love for animals. So mm -hmm. uh, I knew in my, all my illustrations, I used to draw a little white dog with a circle around his eye. And I thought it was just a generic cartoon dog, but an art director told me I was drawing a Jack Russell Terrier. Hmm. And this was before Frasier, and I've never, they weren't that well known, so I, before, <laughs> before the internet too, so I went to the library and looked up Jack Russell's Terriers and was like, oh my God, it's the dog, it's my cartoon dog. Yeah. So uh, I, I went out and got a Jack Russell, his name was Earl, and um, he inspired, you know, so the cartoon illustration became a real dog and then the real dog became my comic strip character oh. so it was like a full circle that he inspired me to to do mutts right. so he was the muse as you yeah, were going yeah definitely along. the muse and the inspiration I, he was he was everything i wanted a dog to be he was my first dog i wanted a dog my whole life mm. and he was just so full of life and so much fun so i figured if i could capture any of his joy in my comic strip that was right. that was my job so and this I, was around the time you were doing illustration and you decided you wanted to do a strip, yeah, so the, the timing that, that, all... The timing all worked out, and uh, so I put some strips together and uh, sent them to uh, the syndicates, and in, in particular King Features. I, was, I went to school with Jay Kennedy, who was the editor at that time, and he was asking me. He knew I wanted to do a comic strip, right. so he was egging me to try. And uh, so I, I showed him. It wasn't called Mutts then. I didn't... It was called Zero Zero. That was the hmm. name of the dog. Um, and uh, yeah, King Features took a shot. That's and then amazing. I was in the, the uh, wonderful world of doing a strip every day. <laughs> yeah, now did, was King the one who came up with the title Mutts? Was that your? You know, I have notebooks filled with names for the characters and names for the strips. And uh, Mutts ended up being the one I liked and I presented it to King and, yeah. and they were okay with it too. Right. And I, I liked Mutts. I liked the fact that we're all Mutts. Mm -hmm. um, I liked the fact that it, you know, it even harkens back to Mutt and Jeff, which mm. was like one of the yeah. first daily comic strips. Um, so, uh, so I thought Mutt was a good name. And then Earl, it's funny. Uh, I, I, like I said, I got to become friends with Charles Schultz. So I, he actually uh, thought that it would be smart of me to uh, name the dog after my own dog, Earl. Mm. And I thought he might know what he's talking about. <laughs> so I, I took his advice, and the Earl became the name of my own dog, Earl. Yeah. yeah. I love that you have in the book. You found the um, the first strip which he signed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sign, when pretty... when the strip the, when the first mutts appeared in the newspaper, uh, Charles Schultz sent me the local, the San Francisco paper that he got. He wrote, "Good start." 
Right. And we you're, included that in the book. Yeah, and you're on the same page as Peanuts. Yeah. That must be a, that must have been Oh a my trip. God, that was yeah. a dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there was other, there's other, you know, we're jumble on that page <laughs> too. Um, so, so this dream of being a cartoonist, this happens, you know, obviously, you know, not overnight, um, but I want to sort of flash forward a little bit. You're, you're working on the comic strip and about 10 years in, you decide to do something a little bit different. Do start to look at children's books. Yeah, well, that was always another dream of mine. Obviously, that was heavily influenced by uh, Charles Schultz and all the comics that I loved, Crazy Cat. And, you know, actually, when I was a, my mom and dad met at Cooper Union Art School, and uh, mm. my mom had Pogo and Jules Pfeiffer paperbacks. So my earliest memories are looking at those paperbacks. Mm. So always loved them. But then, I mean, I just loved the, I just loved art, and, I, and so. Um, but you've done collections of, of newspaper strips. Those have been coming out through, you know, Andrews and McNeil yeah, for yeah. years. Yeah, but another dream was always to also do children books. I loved Winnie the Pooh and Dr. Seuss, mm -hmm. and they were inspirations also. So uh, after 10 years of strip, I found the time <laughs> to uh, start children books. And the first four children books were based on the Mutz characters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the first book, I, I love the story you tell in the book that, you know, you finally, you know, sell your first book. Then you had to basically do it in a weekend? <laughs> well, I, I sold the idea, The Gift of Nothing, uh, which stars Earl and Mooch, um, in, I think it was like November, we went out and tried to sell it to a book company, and Little Brown took it. But not knowing book schedules, they told me that they already did their books for next year, um, so they're going to buy Gift of Nothing, but it wouldn't come out until you know, the, the following winter. I mean, like that's like two years and yeah. you know when you do a comic strip you draw it one day and a couple of weeks later you see it right. and the idea of waiting two years for that book I, I couldn't deal with that deadline <laughs> <laughs> so I said is there any way we could get it for next fall and they said well if you can get it this was on I think a Thursday or a Friday and they said well if you can get it to us Monday so uh, you know doing a comic strip you do learn to draw fast so yeah the first book I drew in a weekend and handed it to him on Monday and I only had to wait a year to see it and it's now it's a classic. Yeah. I mean, when you look at it now, is there anything you would do differently, or you just feel it? No, actually, it's I, like I, a, you know, I'm a big, a time I'm a big, if you look at my artwork, I'm a big believer in the sketch and looseness. Yeah. Um, so actually, I like that book, and it's good that I only had a weekend because yeah. I think, you know, that energy shows in that book. And it's, I mean, it's real sketchy and real loose, but that's the kind of artwork I like. Yeah. No, and I think that's relatable. I think that the artwork of uh, artists like you or even Jules Pfeiffer, it feels relatable to kids. It feels like, not that they could do it, but it doesn't feel like the hand of an adult. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I think that's a big compliment. You know, it, it doesn't sound like one of those. But I feel like, you know, like when you see certain illustrators that's clearly an adult doing that book for kids, but certain artists, and I, I consider you one of those, where, where it's relatable to kids. And I think that makes a big difference in a kid absorbing it and feeling, you know, sort of uh, making it a part of their lives. Oh, thanks. So. Yeah, no, I do take that as a compliment. I think there's, a, and Jules Pfeiffer's uh, an example, that first spontaneity, you know, looseness, yeah. I just feel like has so much life and energy. I, I mean, not that I don't love some artists that are really tight, but uh, it's just a different feel, and I'm more about yeah. the spontaneity. Yeah, and you were very nice. You included a lot of your uh, sketches, uh, pages from your sketchbook in, in the book, and I think it's really fascinating sometimes seeing them side by side, the finals and the <laughs> sketches, and just seeing how the ideas develop, but also just like the idea that comes out organically, yeah, yeah. and then how you refine it. Yeah, no, the book, the book's a lot about the process. I, again, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of artists' sketches, so I wanted to include a lot of those in the book, yeah. because there's just so much energy in those. And I, I just, it, I, it, I think it's interesting to see the little fast sketch I did in the park on my right. notebook, and then the, the final product. Right. Um, yeah, it's funny. I'm really happy with this book. Look, looking at it, I really feel like it's like when I look at it, I feel like I'm looking into my art brain. It's mm. like it's yeah. really interesting. So your whole career, you know, yeah, encapsulated like 25 years yeah. of what's been living in this brain for the last right. 25 years. Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit about that for a sec. You know, going through it's like I mean, you literally have thousands of drawings that you had to cull together and, and pull. Um, and I remember as we were working on this, it sort of, this all happened organically. We were originally going to just sort of update the monograph that Abrams had published um, probably about 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Like 2004, maybe? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so about 14 years 15. ago, and um, we're going to update that. And then, you know, as we were talking about, like, oh, we'll add another 16 pages, and we'll just change, you know, update the cover. It just sort of took on this organic life. How did you sort of go about selecting certain things? Because obviously, you can't include everything. You know, when you do a comic strip for 25 years, I forgot the exact number, but it's close to 10,000 wow. strips. So there was a lot of editing <laughs> involved. Yeah. Although I must say, you know, I had the pleasure of... Um, Charles Schultz had his uh, 40th anniversary book, I think it was. He asked me to choose mm -hmm. those strips, and that was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was a lot of strips yeah. to go through. Was that harder than choosing your own? Probably No, that not. was easier. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you don't have the emotional. Yeah, yeah, no, I just had my favorites. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, going through this was uh, it's like picking family pictures, maybe. It was, oh. it, it was tough. Um, yeah, you, know, it, it, you end up just, I did it intuitively. I, I mean, I was hoping to show, you know, with much, there's a lot more characters than just Earl and Mooch. I wanted to make mm -hmm. sure every character had an example of a strip. Yeah. Um, but mostly it was intuitive, just things that I've enjoyed over the years that felt right. And it was, again, really fun to do notebook pages, only because those I feel really close to, because yeah. I feel like it's, it's my art that, at its uh, at at the moment, so you know. Yeah, I like that too because the book has this flow to it that you and our our designer Sean Dahl um, sort of worked out where it sort of just goes from there's a there's a logical sequence, but it's logical in a in a sort of invisible way. You know, we didn't have like oh let's put all the early childhood stuff in the beginning and then let's have all the sketchbook or whatever. So it's mixed to that there's a fluidity to it, but there's also this sort of nice one thing leads to another. Oh, that's nice. You know? Yeah, and so. I, I, I kind of did that on purpose. Even though it's just a collection of art, I always like themes, and there's definitely themes, and it leads up to some kind of conclusion in, in my head. Yeah. Um, you know, I always try to get to the essence of stuff with mutts and to pare things down, and I always feel like when you keep on paring things away, paring things away, what you're left with is just love. I mean, at, that's, mm. at the end of the day, that's what's the most important. So... I mean, I think there's love throughout the whole book, but at, yeah. at the end of the book, I, I get into the more spiritual strips and the more strips that are really about that bond we have with animals and, and uh, what's really important. So I, I think that story is, is told throughout yeah. the book. Yeah, and animals are so much a part of you and, uh, you, know, you know, animal rights and, and all that. I want to talk a little bit about how that influences your work, you know, your, your sort of, uh, you know, sort of not just belief system, but who you are. I mean, it's, it's know, who... It, the, 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 like I said, when you do a comic strip, you know, it's not like a novel where you know how it's going to end and what the story is. It's really just one day at a time, and mm -hmm. you don't know where it's going, really. Uh, you just, like, build a brick, and at the end of 25 years, you sort of have half of a house done, and you, but it's <laughs> not like you planned it. With the animal rights, you know, like, that definitely involved, evolved. Mm -hmm. um, when I started the strip, I wanted, I was consciously aware that I wanted it to be kind of about my, my dog, and, you know, people have such a strong bond with their own pet, their cat or dog or mm -hmm. ferret or whatever. Um, and I wanted the strip not to be the typical comic strip where there's an animal character, but they're really humans dressed mm -hmm. in cat, you know, that they, right. they do computers and they watch TV right. and they act like humans. I, I wanted my, my animals to be as animal-like as possible. Yeah. I wanted the reader to relate to their own dog and cat. Right. So even though Earl and Mooch obviously talk, um, I was really conscious that they were going to be animals and I would try to see the world through their eyes. Mm -hmm. And in doing this strip, I started thinking more and more about how animals, you know, how, how they are on this planet and how tough a lot of animals have it on this planet. Yeah. And it started with thinking about all the animals, all the dogs and cats that didn't have homes, right. like my own dog and like Earl has with Ozzy and mm -hmm. Mooch has with Millie and Frank. So I started thinking about all the all the dogs and cats in shelters, and I figured it would be nice to include them in mutts. Mm -hmm. So I started uh, shelter stories, and I do that uh, two weeks every year to, to really talk about the animals in shelters that are waiting for yeah. uh, loving guardians. Uh, and then from there, I started branching out and starting to think about a lot of animal issues, you know, how deer don't have any place to live, you know, losing habitat and then uh, fur and and even uh, factory farming. So I really hmm. got, became more aware of how animals have it on this planet and thought it would be good to to try to be their voice in the in the comic strip. 
Mm. And the tightrope is still trying to make it entertaining and not sure. sound preachy. But uh, to just to, to uh, you know, to uh, show more empathy and compassion for all animals. Yeah, I love that. That comes across very much in your work and in, you know, in the art and the words and just sort of the, the heart of what you do. Um, and as you're sort of developing, you know, you start with Earl and Mooch and, you know, this cast of characters sort of develops, you know, and you still add to it? Do you still <laughs> feel like there's, like there's more that you could add in terms of not more ideas, obviously, that's the, that's yeah, the, yeah, more the characters. gig, but more characters? Yeah, I think there's always, uh, there's room. I mean, I've really, you know, it's funny, they, they, it's a cliche that characters after a while write themselves, but I'm, yeah, I know Earl and Mooch so well, it's, it's yeah. hard not to always just go back to them. Yeah. But the cast has grown over the years. I mean, one of the fun things was, you know, I'm, I'm from New Jersey, you probably could tell by my accent, <laughs> but, uh, you know, every summer you go down the shore, go down right. the Jersey shore. So after a few years of doing mutts, I thought, Earl and Mooch should go down the shore. And then that, you know, started a whole new cast of characters with Krabby and mm -hmm. uh, McGarry and uh, Muscles Marinara. So, uh, so that, that was fun to uh, just add all new characters to the strip. Yeah, and I love seeing it through their eyes. You just recently were on Safari in Africa, mm -hmm. and then that series of strips that followed, I found really inspiring. <laughs> I thought those were amazing. Oh, thanks. You know. yeah, I had the, boy, it's the first two-week vacation I've taken in uh, 25 years. Wow. But uh, my wife and I went to uh, Africa, and uh, boy, to, 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 it was very inspiring. And, yeah. and over the years, I've done strips of Earl and Mooch, in particular, dreams of being in Africa. So right. it was uh, an opportunity to do more strips of Mooch dreaming he was in Africa. Yeah, I particularly love the one with the giraffe, you know, <laughs> that you just recently did on its side. That was great. Um, talk Giraffes about, are fun to draw. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're amazing. To and they see are out of too. all the animals in Africa. They're the ones that just that would that would, if I could have a favorite. That was my favorite, just because they're like a Dr. Seuss character. They don't like, feel like they should exist. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, you know, elephants. And, I mean, lions and you know, look like your own cat. And you could kind of relate to them. Yeah. But a giraffe is just like, what is that? I know. It's just amazing. So beautiful and graceful. Yeah. I know. So, I mean, I find that really fascinating to hear about. You know, you know, the hearing about your your. Um, your sort of love of animals and how that comes out in uh, in your strip, but it also comes out in your life too. It's very much a part of who you are and how you live. You know, what are the kinds of you know, sort of how does that manifest itself in your in your daily life? Yeah, that that kind of evolved too. Um, well, you know, my wife and I when we first got married, we decided to become vegetarian, <laughs> and it was we we laugh about it now. My wife said, "Well, we first started out with saying we were only going to eat meat once a day." Mm -hmm. And then that became once a week, and then it became once a month, and then it was like, why are we eating meat at, at all? And, uh, and now, many years later, we're vegan, so that is a big important part of my sure. life. And um, just really important for the world. And I'm real, I've always said, and I'm really excited, I always said that the vegan chefs were going to change the world. And man, yeah. we see that happening now all the I time know. with the Impossible Burger and the uh, Beyond Burger. Yeah. It really is amazing. That's going to save millions of animals' lives. I had my first one, you know, at your suggestion, and I couldn't tell the like difference. It? I loved yeah, it. I thought it was great. amazing. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think that's going to change the world yeah. for a lot of animals. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in doing mutts, I started thinking about the shelter animals, and then I took a broader scope on all animals. And at a, around that time, and it was 2000, the, uh, the Humane Society of the United States uh, asked to have a meeting, and I thought they were going to talk about how I could do things with mutts. But they actually asked me to be on their board of directors. Right. So, you know, as a cartoonist, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> and they said yes. So, um, you know, that opened my eyes even to more troubles and problems in the world. But also to open my eyes to like, you know, the optimism is all the, uh, all the great people that dedicate their lives to, to stand up for animals. It's yeah. like a really amazing group of people that uh, got animals on got the animals back. And I got to meet a lot of them and I got to work with a lot of them. And um, you know, on our site, we at mutts.com, we, uh, we give a, a portion of all, any money we make to uh, the Humane Society's rescue groups. Mm -hmm. um, and also any shelter that, you know, all these shelters have galas and auction items. So we give out mm -hmm. signed prints for free to all the shelters and all, nice. all the rescue groups. And boy, you know, probably one of the most amazing things to do in the comic strip. I, I did a strip with a character named Stinky, mm -hmm. who's my animal rights character. And uh, 
another character, Noodles, ask him how he deals with compassion fatigue, which happens to people who work in, in shelters. Mm. And uh, Stinky responded that his autographed copy of, uh, autographed photo of Jane Goodall helps. Mm. And then the Jane Goodall people uh, institute, the Jane Goodall Institute got a hold of me and asked if they could run that comic strip on their website. Mm. And I said, you could do anything you want with that comic strip. And I said, and I would love to mail you the original that you could give to Jane. And they said, well, Jane's going to be in New York next week. Why don't you give it to yourself? <laughs> and I said, OK. <laughs> so I had the real honor and pleasure to, uh, to meet Jane and uh, wow. had the nerve to ask Jane um, that we should do a kid's book together someday. And she was busy with her own book at the time, but she thought it was a good idea. So I went home and reread her autobiography, uh, Reason for Hope, which mm -hmm. I highly recommend. Yeah. And um, this, there's a photograph of Jane as a, she's not even two years old, like one and a half, and she has a stuffed chimpanzee that her father gave her. And I said, wow, that's, that's the book that this, this girl, this young girl's dream of going to Africa became, you know, she made her dream true. So uh, I did a book called Me, Jane, and Jane Approved. And um, actually, there was a play at the, at the Kennedy Center, and it yeah. just finished touring the United States. That must have been an amazing experience. And she was, she must have been pleased with the play as well as the book, obviously. I had the, uh, <laughs> the pleasure and, and the nerve. Was, I mean, she actually sat next to me on opening night. And wow. she hadn't seen the play before. So it was, but uh, she gave me a nice smile and, <laughs> and oh, said amazing. she liked it. So, yeah. That's amazing. You're doing you know, a daily comic strip. You do children's books. You've done plays that have been at the Kennedy Center. Um, you know, as a kid growing up reading Schultz, you get to meet Schultz, reading comics. And you're a big Crazy Cat fan, you got to do a book on Crazy Cat. You know, when you're growing up, what are, the, what are you reading and how does that all <laughs> sort of become, you know, mutt? Yeah, no, I, I was obsessed with comics. It's like, um, you know, again, my first introduction to comics was Pogo and Jules Pfeiffer from my mom's paperback collection that she had. And then I learned to read with Peanuts, you know, mm. reading Peanuts, and I was just totally in love with Peanuts and Snoopy. And that just, you know, then I started reading the other strips in the paper. When, when, I, I'm, you know, when I was a kid, Dick Chester Gould's Dick Tracy was still mm, in the paper, sure. and uh, Harold Gray's Little Orphan Annie was still in the paper. Um, and then I was lucky. I, in, the, in the 60s, the hippies kind of went back to pass... Um, Art, art like you know, also in W. C. Fields movies and uh, Marx Brother movies were playing in art art houses, and they start rediscovering the old comic strips. So uh, they started reprinting Pop uh, Popeye, mm -hmm. and they started. They did a in 1969. They reprinted a Crazy Cat book, and man, when I started reading those old strips, I was I fell more in love with comics and just wanted to be a comic strip artist and and Crazy Cat in general, another yeah. King feature strip. Yeah. Um, Possibly, I mean, probably, in my opinion, the greatest comic ever. It's just art, poetry, and just fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and luckily now, my God, you can see every crazy cat. I know I mean, there are there's so many books. With, you could literally see every crazy cat that was ever drawn. I think it's a golden age for all of comics. Like yeah. Anything from your childhood that you remember, it's now being brought out in, yeah, in you collections. Yeah, every single you, yeah. <laughs> strip. So, um, yeah, so I became a big crazy cat fan and. This was years before Mutz, but I, I was able to, uh, there was a gallery in New York called the Graham Gallery that actually was the first gallery that showed comic strips as art, and they, mm. sh they sh had a crazy cat show, and I became friends with the, the woman who ran the gallery, and uh, kind of offhandedly mentioned there should be a book about crazy cat, and she called me up a week later and said, Mr. Graham, the head of the gallery, wants to do that book with you, so wow. just out of the blue with Abrams, and it was the first comp, you know, it was literally the first comic monograph that Abrams did yeah. about a George Herman's crazy cat. And uh, I, every time I sit down at the drawing table, I, I, I think of all that history. You sure. know? Like I'm proud to be part of that. You know, I, I think of, you know, I have a crazy cat in my studio and I have a Peanuts in my studio and I look at those every day. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Well, congratulations on 25 years and thank you for sharing what you do with all of us, because oh. it really is the perfect, I get your um, your newspaper strip, you know, it gets emailed to me as part of, uh, you know, the newsletter through mutts.com, and that's like the perfect way to start the day is with a, a mutt strip, so oh, thank thanks. you very much. Thanks, and anyway, thanks for putting out oh. this book, I couldn't be happy with it. Thank you, well this is, it's been an honor to work on this with you, <laughs> and uh, 
know, much, the Art of Nothing, uh, Patrick McDonald, and, um, you know. October 15th. <laughs> October, yes, <laughs> coming October 15th. Um, and uh, for more about Mutz, you can go to comicskingdom.com and visit mutz.com. Thank you. Thanks.